So all good things must come to an end. And the Roman Empire is no different. Um, the reasons for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire have been studied and written about until the cows come home. Um, I mean, there, there is an entire just section of world history literature based around this singular topic. Why would the greatest empire in human history up to this point collapse, right? Um, so we're going to run down some of those reasons. I'm not going to get into massive amounts of depth, uh, but you do need to know the basics here because the problems within the Roman Empire are symptomatic of all large, powerful empires. Um, this list that you see in front of you is not unlike any other list that you're going to see for other empires. Um, you know, some of these are specific to Rome, but the general ideas of the, you know, uh, you know, the general reasons behind these declines, you know, tend to be pretty uniform across most empires. So, um, by the early second century CE, Rome is, beginning its downward spiral. Um, it's going to take several hundred more years, but, um, and you could even make a case that this had started earlier. Probably the most obvious uh, reason for the decline of Rome is, you know, its own success. Um, because of the massive wealth and the massive amounts of power that are up for grabs in the Roman Empire, um, you see a string of very poor, very corrupt leadership within the Roman Empire. Um, you also see massive political infighting, um, civil wars, Roman generals essentially ignoring orders and marching their armies to Rome to, you know, either take power or force the emperor to make changes. Um, also, the spending on the Roman, you know, the, the, the amount of money spent maintaining this empire uh, frequently, frequently bankrupts the Roman government. Um, by the point of its highest, ex of its greatest expanse, uh, the Roman Empire is spending something like 50% of its annual budget just on maintaining the legions that guard Rome. Um, and then when you combine that with, again, poor, corrupt leadership, bankruptcy becomes a annual or semi-annual thing within Rome. Um, another problem within Rome that, again, deals with their success is overexpansion. Um, Rome gets too big to manage. Um, the borders are too vast. There's not enough legions to defend them all. Um, people around the Roman empire, um, begin to not feel the same level of security and safety that they did under the Pax Romana. Um, and Rome's enemies, which are numerous because, you know, it's spent the past 500 years putting the rest of the world under its boot. Uh, begin to poke and prod and start to peel away at the power of the Roman legion. Now, another thing that weakens the Roman Empire is plague. Um, for all of the wonderful things that trade does, and we will talk about this in the next unit in a lot of detail, for all the wonderful things that trade brings, it also brings some not so wonderful things, namely disease. And once Rome reaches the point where they are beginning to engage in trade with other parts of the planet, um, they are introducing diseases and bacteria and viruses into their population that their people have 
you know, no immunity to. And this decimates big portions of the Roman population. Um, there are several plagues across the 200 year period that kill close to 20% of the Roman population. And if you are depending on that tax base, if you are depending on those people to draw from for your legions, uh, you know, a 20% decline in the population is going to severely hamper what the Roman emperor is about to do. Um, also, during the same time frame, you have the spread of Christianity. Now, we typically see Christianity as, you know, or at least some people do, as tolerant and the teachings of Jesus are very, um, you know, love thy neighbor. Um, but at the end of the day, Christianity recognizes only one God. And that one God is pretty clear that thou shalt not have any gods before him. And because of this, as Christianity grows in popularity, it obviously challenges the Roman pantheon of gods. Um, it also challenges Roman political power because after Augustus, this tradition develops that the Roman emperor should be worshipped as a fellow god. And Christians are unable and unwilling to do this. And so this creates several centuries of religious persecution. Christians are hunted down and put to death. Um, they, you know, fight back. They riot within the Roman cities. Um, they burn Roman ships. They, you know, destroy Roman buildings. And, you know, I, yet again, this is just one of many problems that the empire is facing. Um, another big problem that the empire faces is their population is outpacing their food source. Um, especially when you consider that most Roman food comes from one of two places. It comes from provinces in Mesopotamia around the Fertile Crescent, and it especially comes from Egypt and the Nile River Valley. Now, those places are, you know, have long been the agricultural headquarters kind of of the world, but even they are subject to droughts, bad harvests, locusts, problems of, of, of every kind. And if those problems persist for more than a single season, or a single year, what you get is large scale starvation all over the Roman Empire. Um, because again, they have gotten too big to support themselves. And then finally, the last aspect, and this is gonna be the, uh, this is gonna be the challenge that Rome faces that's gonna actually end up bringing it to a close, is external pressures. Um, like we said, Rome spends about 500 years putting their boot on everyone's neck. And as the empire begins to weaken, their enemies begin to see an opportunity. Uh, this includes the Parthians in Persia. This includes Germanic tribes in Northern Europe. This includes um, tribes in North Africa. So as the Roman Empire begins to weaken, these external enemies are going to put more and more pressure on an already overexpanded, corrupt, plague-ridden, bankrupt empire. Now, the Romans obviously do not go down without a fight. Um, this leads to a plan to divide the Roman Empire into Eastern and Western halves in 285 CE. Um, this is undertaken by the Emperor Diocletian, who feels that Rome is too vast for any one person to effectively manage. And so he splits the empire into Eastern and Western halves. Now, the empire does not always remain split. 
other emperors come along and attempt to do away with that and reunite the two halves. But what's done is done. Once Diocletian makes that move to split the two empires, he basically seals the fate of the western half of the Roman Empire and actually increases the chances of survival for the eastern half. Um, this becomes even more apparent in 330 CE when Emperor Constantine once and for all officially moves the capital of the empire out of Rome, out of the, you know, the eternal city into a city known as Byzantium in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, which he renames New Rome, and then is later named after him and becomes Constantinople. So this map gives you an idea of the division of the empire. Um, this, like we said, essentially seals the fate of the Western half. Um, not only is the Western half much more spread out, it's much larger in terms of square mileage, which means that there's more to defend. Um, also, the Western half of the Roman empire is a much smaller population base. People in this part of the empire, with the exception of Rome and some other major cities, are far more spread out than they are in the eastern half. Um, at the same time, the eastern empire has a number of advantages that the western half doesn't have, namely access to all of those wealthy trade routes that are generating billions of dollars in revenue every single year. And after the division, that revenue flows only to the Eastern Empire, which causes further problems with bankruptcy in the Western Empire. And this is eventually going to reach a critical mass where the Western half of the Roman Empire is going to eventually fall. So when does that fall happen? Well, it begins in the fourth century CE, um, you start to get Germanic tribes from Northern Europe that slowly but surely begin pushing into Roman territory. Now, in a lot of cases, this isn't because they want war with Rome. It's more because they're fleeing other or frightening enemies who are moving into their lands, um, mainly the Huns. Um, the Huns are a really particularly nasty warlike tribe from Central Asia who move their way out of Central Asia around the Black Sea and begin to move into Eastern Europe and Northern Europe right around this time. And they chase these other Germanic tribes out of their own land. So the Germanic tribes are essentially forced to make a decision. Um, do we go, you know, into Roman territory and risk war with our old enemy, or do we turn and face the Huns? And most of these tribes make the decision that they're going to side with Rome. Um, Rome takes advantage of this opportunity and they begin to offer these tribes land within their empire in return for mercenary work. Because the Romans realize that, you know what? The Huns are eventually gonna get to us too. And they're somewhat scared of that threat as well. So in their mind, the best way to supplement their legions and help defend their border is to give these Germanic tribes land along the border and make them fight the battles for Rome. Now, unfortunately, Rome and its persistent culture of seeing anyone outside of Rome as barbaric and uncivilized and not as worthy as Rome leads to some pretty brutal mistreatment of these Germanic tribes. Um, the land that they're given proves to be very, very poor, um, not really usable for any kind of sustaining farm life. 
And these Germanic tribes begin to make demands on the Roman Empire. Namely, they want citizenship because with citizenship, they would then be protected by Roman laws. Um, they would be able to marry into Roman families um, and they would just essentially be better treated by Rome. When Rome denies this, um, the Germanic tribes obviously, understandably, get angry, and they begin raiding Roman cities left and right, including the capital of Rome. And once this happens, the Western Empire just begins to just crack at the seams. Um, the city of Rome is conquered, and it is sacked and looted by Germanic tribes five times from 370 to 470. And then in 476 CE, the empire is officially killed off um, when the emperor Romulus is put to death and the king of the Goths, known as Odoacer, essentially takes over his throne and declares himself Roman emperor. So 476 CE, is essentially the time of death for the Western Roman Empire. So make sure, that I told you guys in the beginning, you're not gonna need to know a lot of dates in this class. 476 CE is a date you need to memorize, along with like 1492 and some other ones. Well, 476 CE, you have to know. Now, Here's the fun part about this, is after the fall of the western half of the Roman Empire, the eastern half of the Roman Empire actually kind of goes through a golden age because they are now free of the burden of their weaker sister empire. Um, they no longer have to support them with troops. They no longer have to support them with food. They no longer have to support them financially. And this means that they can focus all of their attention on internal projects, on expansion. And this is going to lead to the Eastern Roman Empire surviving and flourishing well into the next millennia until it's eventually captured uh, in 1453 by the Ottoman Turks. And on this map, you can see uh, you know, a general idea of these external pressures that eventually bring down the Western half and the Roman Empire. Um, all of this, again, really begins with the movement of the Huns out of Central Asia. Um, you can see as they approach Eastern and Northern Europe, the other tribes in and around the Roman Empire begin to feel that pressure and decide that they would rather take their chances against the declining Rome than they would against the Huns. And eventually it's going to be these external invasions that bring down the Western 